I'm a bit special, aren't I, guys? I'm a bit special. We fixed it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I need I need to really get on top of my mic. All right, we'll restart, guys. Thanks for hanging out. <laughs> and a reset. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out. It is the 14th of June, 2016, and welcome to the Pig Daily. Uh, today we're going to be talking about scouting Zerg and how to understand the swarm. So this is going to be a really good episode for Terran players, for Protoss players, and for Zerg players. Basically anyone who's looking to improve their versus Zerg matchup, and most importantly their understanding of scouting. It's very easy at a certain point in the meta to ask a friend or find on a build, what do I scout for to defend this all in, and just have a single thing that you kind of say, oh I just look for that. But build shift times change, and if you've got the proper understanding of how the race works, then you can learn to scout a race through more than one technique by really understanding what's going on. So today we're gonna be looking at uh, just generally what you wanna be looking for with Zerg scouting, how to understand how their production works and how that changes the scouting because it is very different to scouting the other two races. Uh, so it's gonna be a pretty good episode. Um, I did take a few days off, off the daily. Um, we had the weekend, we had Pigsty Cup, which was a lot of fun. Um, I was pretty blown away that actually a lot of people were watching that as well. So thank you everyone who did tune in. That was just a really good, um, it's basically just a barbecue, having some beers, playing some Starcraft. So that was a lot of fun. And of course, yesterday, got to have a second barbecue because it was the Queen's birthday, which is a very religious and special occasion here in Australia, where we just get drunk and eat barbecue food because you don't have to go to work. So that's always fun. So uh, it's good to be back to the daily, though. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about that. So uh, First half, we're going to look at just uh, one or two replays of mine while talking through all the concepts of Zerg scouting. So understanding how Zerg production is different, uh, how to scout a little bit differently against them. Um, we're going to look at some builds of me just kind of doing doing generic, very basic uh, aggression and players not scouting for it properly, not quite being ready. And then in the second half of the show, we're going to look at Showtime um, pressuring the crap out of Violet at WCS and really showing like the the kind of aggressive keeping in check style of scouting and an entire play style that has so many waves of scouting built into it that really allow him to just make sure no funny business can happen so um we're going to be kind of looking at it from both both perspectives first of all just cheesy attacks working because players aren't scouting quite well pointing it out and then in the second half pointing out you know the bloody protoss god showtime that he is the the defensive mastermind and how he just kind of shuts everything down and stays on top of it so um, I do apologize, guys, for the <laughs> for the uh, mic issue at the start. But yeah, let's just dive on into game. Let's start talking about the concepts. Um, no need to bluster and blather for too long. So let's do it. All right. So this is literally a game I played like tw 20 minutes ago. And um, we're just going to kind of throw this on my camera. Actually, we'll throw it on our opponent. Yeah, we'll throw it on. We'll throw it on my camera for now, and then we'll, we'll swap over to the opponents in a little bit. So, one of the the first things we want to talk about, and this has been talked about to death back in the day, but I do think, especially in the last year and a half of StarCraft, we haven't really gone back to these basic concepts as much and talked about them. So, if you've been around since the start of StarCraft two, I'm, I'm sure you've heard us talking about lava all the time. It's something that we always go back to with Zerg, but it's about the lava decision. So do you build fighting units? Do you build drones? We can see here at the start of this game, obviously we're building drones, unless you're doing the earliest possible spawning pool rush. But that's something you've always got to ask. As a Zerg player, the thing that makes them different is their hatcheries are their production. Their units, their drones, they're always built out of the exact same resource. So Zerg always has to make a decision between economy and fighting units. And I mean, you can always see a decision whenever anyone goes for a big aggression, right? Like you can say, hey, they have to choose, right? They've always got to choose between, am I going to commit a lot to fighting or am I going to kind of just bank up and take a faster third, add more, you know, tech and, and upgrades and all these sort of things. But with Zerg, it's much more pronounced. It's basically like, well, no, you can't like build some units and keep building your economy. You are just building one or the other most of the time. And while you can kind of kind of do a bit of both at the same time, for the most part, it really does force Zerg to produce units in waves. And it's kind of like they're either committing hard to economy or they're committing hard to units. So 
it changes up scouting a lot. Whereas with a Terran or a Protoss player, you can kind of just look at the um, you can kind of just look at uh, the uh, the barracks count, the gateway count. You can spot the production. You can see a DT shrine, or you can see like a really fast starport with a tech lab, and that's going to give you a lot of information. But against a Zerg player spotting, say, a Roach Worm, it tells you something, but it doesn't tell you everything. Spotting a fast spire, it tells you something, but the thing is, <clears throat> a single spire doesn't even need to be used because Zerg just needs a single tech structure and then any of their lava can turn into that thing. What really tells us the most about what a Zerg player is doing is are they building drones or are they building fighting units? And if they are building those drones, we know that they're not going to be aggressive for a while. If they are building those fighting units, we know it's slowing down their economy, but it's giving them the, the potential to be aggressive and shut certain things down. Let's watch, swap cameras here. So that's kind of the concept we're always going to be going to be revisiting, right? We're just going to be talking about this idea of, okay, Zerg's got to build one or the other. So a lot of people complain, oh, you know, how I can, I need to, I need to scout the Spire and just a single Spire and Zerg can build, you know, 20 Mutalisks out, but that's not necessarily the case. It's so much more about just keeping an eye on what Zerg's doing in terms of, well, if they've got to make that choice between drones and units, what's the number one scouting thing we can do? Check their mineral lines. If there's lots of workers there, they're not building fighting units. You can just do something that simple. And as the game goes on, definitely Zerg does have more tech switching power than other races. This is something people sometimes complain about. The fact that Zerg can build 20 meters and then suddenly swap back to you know 30 hydralisks. And they didn't need to build 10 hydralisk dens and 6 spires to do those big tech swaps. Whereas a Protoss player has got to build his 10 gateways, his 3 stargates to do like a crazy fast tech switch. Um, and that's definitely something that is a strength of Zerg, but on the other hand, Zerg's units tend to just be a bit weaker in front on engagements, so that kind of balances out in its own way. We're not going to spend too much time talking about that, because that's just an inherent feature of Zerg. Really what we want to focus on though is how do you know when they're going to attack you, and we're focusing mostly on the early to mid-game stages. As the game progresses, the races are always going to clash, they're always going to engage. Definitely scouting for what tech they're going for, scouting for how they're building their economy is important. But I think when you're first understanding another race and the information which will naturally carry over to the next point, you really just want to be thinking about it in terms of like, okay, what can I scout that's telling me he's going to attack me? And on the other side, what's, what am I going to scout that's going to tell me he's definitely, you know, he's definitely not going to attack me. So either is he being greedy or is he being aggressive, one or the other. And uh, yeah. Basically, just scouting those workers is the number one thing. So let's look in game here and let's try and apply that. What could our Protoss player in this game be looking for? Well, in the early game, he's come across with a probe. He's kind of del delayed the natural, scouted, okay, fast pull and gas had to go down, and then a natural. And then the probe actually kind of saw a drone trying to get the third. And that's about it. So in the initial stage, our Protoss player here has said, well, you're building expansions. You're trying to take a third expansion. I know that I am safe because you actually built some drones. You didn't just build the fastest possible spawning pool on 12 supply and then try to just YOLO into my base with just mass slow zerglings or speedlings. He knew that I was committing to other things here. And that's one tier of scouting, which says, okay, I'm safe to build my Nexus to probe up, add some tech. However, what we're gonna see in this game, and let's just fast forward through, is he's just very focused on denying scouting with a stalker goes for a third base, he's just chilling, there we go, oh, a whole crap load of Ravager Ling comes in, and, ah, that's no fun, goodbye Protoss, and I'm not too focused on what this specific attack is, but it's just like, this is something we've all felt, right? You feel like you're scouting well early on, you're getting a decent number of production up. And then Disgusting Zerg comes out of nowhere with 5 billion units and just kills all your stuff. That's a pretty bad feeling, right? So, <laughs> this is a really good replay because it gives us an example. Okay, so what are the main things you want to be looking for? Okay, we've talked about spotting the drone saturation. That's the most important. Coming in and checking their building drones on those bases. Now, what are a few other things we want to talk about in this and the next replay? Production facilities. So is Zerg actually taking extra hatcheries? If they're not taking extra hatcheries at a fast enough timing, they're not going to be able to keep up in production. There's just no way they can do it because 
these are their not only their unit building structures but also their droning structures whilst a fast extra base doesn't necessarily mean zerg's committing a huge amount to economy it's the first thing you need to kind of spot for that and in this game remember he spotted the natural he saw the third was trying to be taken maybe he should have gone back and checked on that okay so those were two things he checked for uh you can also check for gas mining eh, not so important this replay not something he could have got too much information on so let's go back into game and let's think about what could he have actually done to see what was happening. So, how does this Zerg build work? It's literally just, okay, you denied my natural for a bit. I've ended up getting it a bit later. I'm going to take a third. Here's the first thing. He doesn't actually know the third's gone down. He's just seen a probe, try, uh, a drone trying to take that. What would be something Protoss could do already just to check that this third went down? Grab a probe, send it out around the side of the map and come in here. And just kind of take a look and go, oh, yep, that third's finished. And you know what? He could even time it out so he could wait about a minute. And then at like four minutes, he could say, this hatchery's been done for a little bit. Come on in. And let's let's check out. So four minutes. I imagine a probe walks into this base at this time and he says, ha ha, you have committed to extra production, to this extra base. But not only that, wait, there's no drones here. Uh, okay, and that's got to ring some alarm bells. That's got to set something off in the Protoss's head to say, why aren't there any drones on this base? Are you just building units? Likewise, if he somehow snuck an adept in to the natural and saw like, oh, you got a, you got a fast second gas. Okay, that doesn't really tell us too much. That could mean anything. All right. Um, hmm, what could we look for if if we had some scouting? Maybe hallucination, maybe an adept. Well, the number one thing is not just checking are there drones on the base, but what's coming out of the eggs. There's pretty much always units popping out of eggs. So every single time you're scouting in a Zerg's base, if you just see what's popping out of the eggs, it gives you a really good indication of exactly what the Zerg's focusing on that time. And all you need to see is a few roaches popping out and like running across the map like this. And you can automatically, just from this little bit of vision, kind of assume there's a good chance the Zerg's coming to attack you. Just one little piece of information is usually all you need to get a pretty good indication of what Zerg's doing. But that being said, does it mean everything? No. Scouting is always about taking many pieces of information and combining them together. So we want to be scouting a drone line to see on the newest base, has he been droning up his newer bases? And usually, this is actually, in my opinion, easier scouting than it is, say, against a Protoss player, where you've got to get inside the main base to try and check his gateways, check his tech. Because you can always check the newest base, the most exposed Zerg base, and you can see, are there workers here? So it's quite easy, I think, to, to often sneak either a worker in, an adept, or a harassment unit of some kind, and check that. See, is the Zerg droning up? If they're not, build some extra defense. But that's just one thing. It's also what's popping out of the eggs. Oh, but I did see some drones popping out of the eggs when I went deeper in the base, or... I did see a few units popping out and running across the map as well. Then you're like, okay, well, there's no guys on the third base. Even though the third was on a normal timing, that, that's kind of a sign of greed. But on the other side of things, on the sign of aggression, we're like, saw units popping out, not drones. Saw no drones on the third base. Okay, things are starting to, starting to weigh up in the favor of he's going to be aggressive. If you see just no drones on a base, you can't necessarily read anything into that. Because what if he is just droning and he's, say, rushing up his gas? He's going up to a fast lair and fast tech. So you never want to make a hard read off one piece of information. You always want to be trying to gather multiple pieces of information to kind of piece the whole story together. And that kind of brings us to something we're going to be talking about a lot later, which is having built-in pressure to just see these things automatically as part of your build. And also, something we're going to talk about a lot later as well is if you are pressuring the Zerg, you force them to build fighting units rather than drones. So even without necessarily getting a big scout off, by forcing a reaction, you kind of know what you're pushing the Zerg towards. And that's one of the most common ways of scouting Zerg. Because Zerg has such mobile, fast units, a lot of players want to be out there attacking, attacking the Zerg player, pressuring them. Not only does that often allow them to dart into the newest bases and see if there's drones there, but it forces a lot of units out, forces the Zerg to show their unit composition, and really gives a whole lot of information. And that's something which, which could have been applied in this game. So let's take a look at this Protoss player's build, and this is where the big flaws were. So normally, in a solid PVZ build, 
Okay, this is this is a pretty fast Twilight Council. Already got Glaive started. Not not super fast. Could be a bit earlier. But oh, uh, he squeezed out the Stalker and the Zealot, so the Stalker did a nice scouting. So it's like, okay, alright. Glaive's not that fast, but pretty fast. Now normally the slowest you add extra gateways in ZVP is about 3 minutes 15. Now this is a very matchup specific thing, very, very current meta. Um, I don't normally like to talk too much about these, I'd rather talk about the broad concepts, but let's talk about it in this scenario. Now, why do Protoss players always drop those gateways? It's so they can warp in a couple rounds of Adepts. As Glaives finish, those Adepts can push across the map, and right around 5 minutes, when this upgrade's done, 4 minutes 50, sometimes even 4 minutes 40, you can have 7, 8 Adepts on the Zerg side of the map, hitting this very crisp, aggressive timing, and that kind of really forces the Zerg to show their hand, forces them to build a lot of units, uh, and really, it, it also scouts what the Zerg's up to. It sees any all-ins that are coming. It gives you, you know, a good base of production. But in this build, we don't see that. We see a fast Twilight. But let's take a look at this build. A Robo? And only now starting to put down gateways when it's almost four minutes. Hmm. So check this out. Check out the timing. We're going to see Glaive's finish. And, oh, okay, you're going for a very fast Warp Prism. Isn't that cool? So there's going to be a very fast Warp Prism. There's going to be a very fast Glaives. But what is there to use this Glaives? What is there putting on pressure? I was talking about how right now, there could be seven or eight Adepts on the Zerg side of the map. And, oh, look at this. The attack is already happening. So we see, simply through looking at what the very top players are doing right now, always hitting this, this pressure at about 4 minutes 50, 4 minutes 40, we see that that serves a purpose in of itself, right? So... <clears throat> By comparing this to the, the top level play, and this is something you can always do to your own play, you say, well, they never die to this timing. No no one does a five minute Roachling or Roachling Ravager timing at pro level at the moment. It just doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? Because all of the standard Protoss pressures are always hitting before it can get across the map, so they always scout it coming. So in this particular game, they would have seen it coming over here, or at least about halfway across the map, and then there would have been the scouting, instead of being completely blind, having no idea this is happening, no Nexus would have gone down, we would have been, you know, chrono boosting out Immortals, warping in Adepts, Mothership Core would be heading back to the natural and instantly overcharging these pylons, more pylons would be going down. There'd be so many different things a Protoss player here could do differently in order to win this game. But it all comes down to that scouting, and instead, I mean, what was the plan here? Six Gateway Warp Prism Adept with Glaives? Ooh, so... This is actually a bit of a greedy play. He was going for this really hard aggression, getting out the Warp Prism and the Glaives as fast as possible, going to warp in a hell of a lot of Adepts, and taking a fast third at the same time. So our Protoss player's build here was a bit risky. It had some nice scouting at the beginning of the game, and then it just kind of turtled up, didn't see anything on the map, and yet went for a delayed pressure. So this brings us to the point of this is the importance of doing crisp pressures against Zerg to make sure you're seeing what's going on at those weak timings, at those points where if you don't know something's coming, you might just die to it. So this is something, uh, this is why we see Terrans go for tanky vax. This is why we see Zergs Ling Bane pressuring each other constantly. Even in ZVZ, you're in a constant battle to not just play too middle of the road. Because if you just sit there and you try to both just build economy and be safe again, so it's a balancing act which you can pull off, but if you don't have some sort of built-in pressure to scout, then Zerg can just put every single bit of money into drones. Zero units out, and you're there building a mixture of defense and economy. And, you know, your economy is kind of building up a bit jaggedly, and their, their drone count just goes straight through the roof. So you're looking to do these pressures to, number one, punish a greedy Zerg, and number two, defend against an aggressive Zerg. So this is why putting pressure into your build and actually making sure you use your units aggressively is so damn important against a Zerg player. So, <clears throat> we've talked now about this replay, um, I think in pretty good detail, of course, there wasn't the scouting, didn't quite work out. Likewise in ZBT, it's the same thing, you can't always get the scouting constantly. So, one of the big things which um, I was thinking people would probably be asking today, so I try to kind of preempt some of the questions, is, well, we talked about the biggest scouting thing being scout the newest base, see if there's drones popping out, right? So, let me just just opening up a ZVT at the same time. Uh, so we talked about that, but how do you know when a base should be saturated as well? So, if especially if you're a newer player, what 
timing sense? Are you looking at a base and saying, this is late? Or how do you know when you should be pressuring? How, how do you know when to do all these things? Part of it's learning how the game tends to be played out at your own skill level. Uh, you know, I could list out pro timings for certain things to happen. You kind of have to get a feel for when you, you tend to be dying to certain attacks. And also coming up with benchmarks for in economic games, at what point does your opponent normally take their third? Okay, so you're checking is the third down at that timing. And then you can do things like, okay, sorry, just pause in the replay because we don't want, we don't have that on screen yet. Um, yeah, so, so thinking about it, what time is the third down? What time does the third normally get a lot of drones on it? That's kind of the time you want to be checking, right? You want to be seeing, okay, there's normally a good, ha good handful of drones on the base at this time. You check in, there's no drones. Okay, maybe something's up. Obviously, there's always room for flexibility. Everything can't be exact. It's not like you're like, oh, there's normally two drones on this base. I'm checking this base in game. There's not two drones. He must be all inning me. Like I said, it's always about gathering all your pieces of information and lining them up together and then taking the kind of collated total and, and going with that. So let's dive into a ZVT here and we're just going to kind of fast forward through this because this is another game where, um, where a player kind of, I think does a much better job of scouting. I was telling him, I was telling him, because he was like, hey, I like the daily. It's helping me a lot with my, my Zerg off race. And I was like, well, you better scout a lot because I might use this replay today. And um, we're going to see the very typical Reaper come across, right? Reaper, very early on, he went for an SCV behind before that, checked it was just a hatch gas pool. And you can really see that the Reaper, the most standard part of TVZ play, exists for a very standard, solid reason. And that is to check what time the third base goes down, to make sure Zerg's not too greedy early, you know, forcing these Zerglings out. Just to be a bit of a pain, but then also to do a follow-up scout to make sure there's not an all coming. What you'll see at the highest levels of TVZ is almost always a Reaper sacrificing into the main base, trying to do a ring around the Rosie in there to check if there's some sort of Roach all in on the way. And you know, if he denies a third base like that, that's fantastic. That's just beautiful. But what we see this game, and this is something which our Terran player is going to mention at the end, is he takes too long to decide to jump into the main. He was actually sitting in Overlord Vision there for a long time. He gets rejected by the Zerglings. And now he doesn't really know what's going on. So this is what we're talking about in terms of what if you can't get the information? Sometimes it's a little bit scary. Uh, you know, he knows there's a third down, but as we saw in that previous game, what if the Zerg doesn't use the third? I mean, already the third going down means the Zerg can't hit as hard and all-in timing. If there's no third base, you've got to be like much more careful against a potential all-in. Because if the Zerg took that 300 minerals, just put that straight towards fighting units, goes across the map, obviously they can hit you a little bit faster. So we kind of get this idea of scouting things in kind of gradations and saying, if I see this, I'm safe for another minute or I'm safe for another 30 seconds. And it's not always exact in your head, but you get an idea. You say, ah, oh, he's, he's committing to a third hatch. Okay, he can't hit that hard. Oh, now I see drones on the third hatch. Oh, he definitely can't hit me very hard. Ah, okay. I see there's like a lair up, some evo chambers, like all these sort of signs of, of economy. Okay, you know, it's fine. On the other hand, you don't see any of those things. You just see units coming out. You're like, crap, build defense right now, man. So let's just put this on our Terran player's view. And you can see that, you know, his vision is not particularly great. However, he's going for a Medank, a Medivac and a Siege Tank, which is one of the most standard things in TVZ right now as well, because Terran players know there's a lot of different crazy Ravager timings, a lot of aggression that can come out. And what is one of the perfect ways to both defend aggression as well as to scout and put on pressure and be annoying? It's a siege tank in a medevac. A siege tank in a medevac can hold on against almost any all-in as long as it keeps getting microed, as long as it's in position in time, and it can put the pressure on the other side of the map. So this is kind of one of those things where it's like, yeah, even if the Reaper doesn't see everything, even if we don't know 100% what's going on, the siege tank in the medevac is just going to help keep us quite safe. And that's why this is going across the map now. However, remember what we said, this Reaper has just taken so long to actually go in and scout. Only now going back in, seeing, wait, there's no drones on the third. Uh oh, there's roaches and lings popping out of these eggs. And that was a bit of a late scout because if we look back home, there's only a few Marines. We really would have liked to start building Marauders already. 
extra unit production rather than just adding a third CC in reactors. But Terran can still defend. This is the beauty of having a sort of good aggressive slash defensive pressure. Same with the Glaive Adepts in game one. If your opponent's going for a, a Roach Ling timing, your the Roaches can't catch the Adepts. Your Adepts can... Well, you can kind of try and try and intercept the reinforcements, which is kind of the, the higher level, but also riskier thing you can do. And it's the same with the siege tank. You can kind of try and like cut off the reinforcements and, you know, threaten to, to shade past with the adepts and try and pull them home. Or you can just send your units home and just defend at the front. And that's usually the safe way to play. Here in this particular game, our Terran player is not going to do that. Complete. Tries to do some fancy stuff, picking off the reinforcements with his siege tanks. And, oh! His walls are already getting hit, and his siege tank's all the way out here. He should be shelling one. So he takes a bit too long to get home with his siege tank. Didn't have an extra wall built at all. Would have been better if he had some engineering bays or something added in there. Doesn't get this part of the wall up. Just generally makes a few mistakes. Not a perfect game from our Terran player. However, imagine if there was a couple Widow Mines here on top of this ramp. All those Zerglings would have just disappeared. Imagine if there was another Siege Tank. Imagine if there was a few more Marauders and Marines. Or if the wall was bigger. Simply having the scouting information earlier on in this game would have made our Terran's job so much easier. So if he sacrificed the Reaper earlier, and what would he have been looking for? Let's, let's imagine he sacrifices the Reaper earlier. What, what could he kind of hunt for? Let's say 3 minutes 30. I think that, that's probably a pretty decent timing to be checking. 3 minutes, 34 minutes, thereabouts. So let's imagine the Reaper gets into the base, sees everything. Well, pretty standard stuff. Uh, only one guy mining gas. Uh, that's actually a mistake in, in my build. But let's say he sees the natural as well. Um, okay, grabbing some extra gases, a roach horn. Yep. Doesn't really tell you anything, does it? Sometimes you scout and it just looks normal. That's, that's the point of this all-in. That previous game, if an adept got in there and it sees like, yeah, no drones on your third, you're just kind of pumping out units without even fully saturating two bases, yeah, it looks pretty sus. But in this particular game, it's a little bit less all in, um, I would say. It looks a little bit more normal. And sometimes you're going to run up against those builds. However, these builds aren't as strong. Remember what we talked about, if you spot a third hatchery, that already weakens a build. In this case, it's a third hatchery, two mineral lines fully saturated, three gases, there's a third queen. There's all these things that would be in a normal build. And while that helps sell the idea of it, if you're doing a solid safe build, as long as you scout a little bit later, just before the attack's kind of coming, have your units in position, you should be completely fine. In this scenario, it wasn't necessarily about scouting at this point. It was just about scouting and reacting once we saw it coming. As much as we would have loved to have the information straight away and build a second siege tank immediately, even if we did scout here at 4 minutes 30, which we do, uh, 4 minutes 40 or so. At this point, the Reaper just jumped in, it saw the Roaches and Lings, we have a tank outside the base. Like we said, ah, build an engineering bay, build another engineering bay, block up the front a little bit, or... Let's, uh, you know, let's swap the factory back into the tech lab and get a siege tank. Or let's just queue up some marauders. Or, you know what? Let's just build two widow mines when this reactor finishes. Instead, the factory is kind of swapping around into tech labs. Mm, still building marines rather than marauders. For some reason, the starport's building a reactor when it could be building a liberator. A liberator would be fantastic on top of this ramp up here. The siege tank covering it. There's lots of different things that you can do to change up your defense. All right, so that's looking through those those two replays. Um, so in terms of scouting Zerg, let's let's start to summarize uh, as we get to the end of this first half of the show. Number one, you just want to scout their drone lines. You want to check in those bases and see are they actually droning those bases. Even before that, you want to check are they taking their bases at the standard timing. So in each matchup, you want to say a Zerg should have a third. For instance, we're just watching ZBT. You could say three minutes thirty. If they don't have a third by say we'll give them a bit of leeway in case they just mess up uh, 345 if they don't have a third by 335 uh, 345 maybe four minutes i'm gonna play a bit safer i'm gonna build a siege tanker i'm gonna build a second siege tanker an extra bunker you know you can have these like built-in little bits of extra safety just from seeing a lack of something so seeing no third okay seeing no drones on the third 
These are all very important things. Now, what's something else? Gas mining. We haven't really talked about gas mining too much, but let's touch on that now. I think gas mining is especially important for particular all-ins. Um, it's very kind of temperamental because normally it's not the fact that someone isn't mining gas, which tells you. It's normally the fact that they're not building drones for their newer base. And you've got a much easier job of scouting their newest, most exposed base being bare of drones than you do of like getting into the main and being like, there's a missing gas geyser here. I think that means he's doing something because maybe he's just someone who plays a bit low on gas to get more drones out. Like it, reading into your gas can be a little bit temperamental, but let's let's talk about it nonetheless because this is one of those many puzzle pieces which we really want to want to understand. Here in the main, let's look at this attack. Five minutes fifty. Let's imagine we can't scout the third for whatever reason. It could be filled with drones for all we know. But here in the main base, we're like, okay, no gas yet. Okay, no lair kind of tells us, tells us something, doesn't it? But it can kind of give you a big tell. If they're not investing in gas, it usually means that they're going to be investing in some sort of aggressive play or heavy economy play rather than tech. So if you see someone, for instance, if your bases are limited, if you're both playing two base versus two base, say there's no third hatchery and then you see no gas, this really limits your opponent's options, right? Now, why does that limit your options? So let's think about it. If your opponent only has two bases, then they can only be either doing a very fast all-in attack or teching up very fast. Now, the reason for this is if someone's building economy, which is kind of your third option, right? So there's attacking, teching or economy. The reason they can't be building their economy is if they don't have that third base, building their economy is just not going to be, it's not being done well. It's crap. What's the point in building your economy if you don't have the extra production to support it? So this is something why it's important to scout for those extra bases as Zerg, because it helps limit those options. So then if you scout in their base and you see four gas geysers and a lair already finished, you can be like, oh, he's teching to like fast two base muter, or he's teching to like some sort of fast nidus worm, some sort of, you know, high tech play. But if they've got the third base, then suddenly you see the lack of gas and you're like, oh, that doesn't mean anything. But if they don't have the third, you see no gas, you're like, he's all inning me. This guy's going to come for my throat and he's going to attack me straight away. So you've always got to take into account gas with every race as well. Gas can only really be invested in basic fighting units for each race. This one applies to all races. Terran, it's got to be Marines, Marauders, Zealots, Adepts, Stalkers for Protoss, Lings, Roaches for Zerg. The only other thing that mineral heavy economies can really invest in is taking lots of extra bases, building lots of workers. So it kind of limits their options and allows you to make a good read there. All right. So I think we've covered the first half of this pretty well. Um, one last question, what if he's bad and just doesn't take gases? How do I read into this? Um, so something in general as well. If you're someone who's not, not, just, not necessarily just with gases, but what if my opponent's just bad and he doesn't take drones? And this is something people always, always say in StarCraft. I, at my level, they just don't take the third until seven minutes anyway. So how am I supposed to scout? The thing is, once you play below a certain level, because people aren't playing crisp, tight games, they're not spending their money, you can't necessarily read into someone's economic actions as much. At that level of play, you want to focus more on map control. As long as you can see them move out or you can just scout their general kind of compositional choice, that's what you want to be focusing on. Because it, as you said, it's too sloppy. It's too kind of loose in terms of how they're building their economy for you to make a tight read on that. All right, guys, so we're just going to take a very quick break and then we're going to dive into the second half of the show while we uh, load up that replay. So I'll be right back. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Just one minute. 